Um, just as a little bit of a warning, the back half of chapter eight tends to be quite challenging, so just keep keep that in mind. You did. Right. Isn't it so much better starting with that chapter than this one then? Yes. Okay. Let's let's break side. Hey, I just want to be straightforward. Right? Um, in particular, one of the things that becomes difficult for students is there's a lot of notation that has very specific meanings that we end, end up employing this chapter that we build out here in the first couple of sections that are not too difficult, but if you like can't get the notation straight on what that means, becomes kind of a problem later on. Um, so just wanted to give you the little bit of warning, right? Like if you got a if you want to make sure you're all the way on point for this chapter, that's probably a good idea. Okay. Tends to be a challenging one. Yep. Well, again, this the you know I have 24 pages of notes or whatever so it's not like we're gonna be doing those 120 problems in one week so keep that in mind okay uh, we're gonna start here the first section talking about two-dimensional vectors um, some of us are familiar with vectors from previous course, some are not. We're going to start right from the beginning as assuming that nobody knows nothing about anything. Um, so when we talk about a two-dimensional vector, what we're talking about is um, a two-number quantity. I'm going to do it this way. So a two-dimensional vector is a pair of real numbers that represent both magnitude and direction. Okay. Um, so, a couple different ways that we can represent a vector. One is um, just like listing a magnitude and direction. So an example that you might be familiar with is you got the plane that's flying at 145 miles per hour at a bearing of, you know, 152 degrees or something like that. So the quantity, the miles per hour, is our magnitude. And the bearing of 152 degrees is our direction. Right? So that's an example of a vector quantity that we're familiar with, because I think in first semester we dealt with some navigation problems similar to this. Right? So we're going to start, in this chapter, we're going to look at recasting these as vector problems. Okay. Another representation is um, a picture. You know, for example, 
I might draw this as my vector. Where the length here is going to equal our magnitude. And then, like, if we kind of draw in a imaginary xy axis there at the start of our arrow. that would kind of represent our, you know, we could use our standard position angle to represent our direction there. And the next one we're going to talk about is component form. Um, so the component form is if I have some vector v, typically we represent a vector variable with a little hat on top of it, like I draw these little half arrows or whatever, to let you know that this is a vector quantity as opposed to like our standard variable, like an x or a y. Hi, hey Ben. Oh, Jillian and Peyton, you guys have get-out-of-jail-free tickets, it looks like, if you want to come up and get them whenever you're ready. Um, so when we draw a vector quantity, or when we write down a vector quantity in component form, we're going to use these wedged brackets to represent that it's a component form vector quantity. And then we need two components to represent our vector. Now the A and B don't really represent directly the magnitude or direction. They're just two numbers. OK with that? Now, when we say our standard representation of component form, and really, when we say component form, we really just mean this standard representation of component form. We say that that V equals AB. Um, is the vector um, that has the um, the tail of the vector at the origin and the head of the vector at the point a b So if we go back to this picture that we've drawn here, the tail is that end of the arrow, and the head is the point of the arrow, right? Everybody's cool with that vocab? Okay. So we have these three ways to represent a vector. We can describe it via magnitude and direction. We can describe it with a picture, or we can describe it in this component form. Okay.
Um, we're going to introduce a little bit of notation, then we're going to spend some time talking about how we can move back and forth between these different forms. So how can we go from a component form to a magnitude and direction, or from a graph to a component form to a magnitude and direction, you know, just how we can kind of move back and forth between these different forms or these different representations, okay? Um, so a little bit more vocab. So again, when we talk about magnitude, we said that could represent the length of the arrow. And the notation that we're going to borrow to represent the magnitude is we're going to use the absolute value bars. Now, you need to recognize here that the absolute value bars are not absolute value bars in this case because they're surrounding a vector. Can't take the absolute value of a vector. That kind of operation is not defined. The absolute value operation is defined only on real numbers. So when you use the vertical bars around a vector, you have to recognize that we're talking about a magnitude and not an absolute value. Okay? So we're using the same symbol, but we need to be able to tell the difference between the two symbols based on what's inside of that pair of vertical bars. If there's a vector inside, we're talking about magnitude. If there's a real number inside, you're talking about absolute value. And if you remember really far back in detailed into your Algebra 2 class, if there's a matrix inside, you'd be talking about a determinant. Maybe some of that rings a bell there as well. So there's actually three different operations that use that vertical bars notation. And depending on what's inside would tell you which one of those three things the vertical bars mean. Most people don't remember determinants from... That was a quick little aside in an Algebra 2 class when talking about a matrix. But it uses that same notation. Okay. Okay. So what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about changing these different forms. So we're going to talk first here about going from a picture to a um, component form. So here's my picture. I have a point at the tail, x1, y1, and a point here at the head, x2, y2. Everybody okay with that? If you're given a picture, you can always read the coordinates off the graph, right? So if I'm calling this vector v, we'd say that V in component form is x2 minus x1, comma y2 minus y1. Sometimes we refer to this as the head minus tail rule. I just abbreviated head minus tail as HMT, but it's head minus tail. Because we're taking the components of the head and subtracting them from the components of the tail. Now, geometrically, what is that really doing? Remember the definition of our standard representation for component form? 
is that the tail needs to be at the origin. So basically all we've done is we've taken it and translated it, you know, x1 to the left and then y1 down, which now seats the tail at the origin. So all we did was apply to translation, like you would in geometry, right? But this is the big takeaway because really we're not going to be doing this geometrically. We would want to be doing this algebraically because it's much less paper intensive. Okay. Um, what if I want to go from the picture to um, Oh, let's, what do I want to be careful here? Yeah, I guess it's fine. If I want to go from the picture to magnitude and direction, actually, let's be, let's be clear here. Let's, uh, let's do it this way. Let's do component form for, to magnitude and direction, because in all reality, if you want to go from picture to magnitude and direction, the easiest way to do it would be to switch it into component form and then do those calculations to get to magnitude and direction. I, I would never recommend going directly from the picture to magnitude and direction because it's just kind of it's the same amount of work, but it's like less to keep track of. It's a little bit easier. Um, so let's say we have some vector v in component form. So if I want the magnitude of that vector, the magnitude is the same as length, right? Now. So to calculate the length of something in the coordinate plane, we're going to use the distance formula. All right? You guys remember the distance formula? The square root of x1 minus x2 squared plus y1 minus y2 squared. So in our case, our head of our vector is at the point AB, and the tail of our vector is at the origin, that's the point 0, 0. So here, really, x1 is a, x2 is 0, y1 is b, y2 is 0. So that really just simplifies down into the square root of a squared plus b squared. Everybody so far so good? Let's talk about direction. I guess we should probably say, label that part as magnitude. So the direction we're going to use here for our vector AB is going to be um, just a standard position angle. Now my suggestion for what I would do is I would always use a standard position angle between 0 and 360. I wouldn't want to use a negative angle. I wouldn't want to use something bigger than 360. Since we're just talking about a vector, it has to, you know, the direction, every direction can be described between 0 and 360 because we're not talking about something spinning on a machine or something where it makes sense to have. So just, you know what I mean, guys? Okay. So let's say that I just have, 
here's my vector. AB. Everybody good with that? And we're looking for this angle then. I'm going to call that angle theta. Everybody cool? Does this look real familiar? Does this look exactly like a first semester problem? Good. I'm going to treat it exactly like a first semester problem would. I'm going to call this angle um, alpha. And I know that this piece is 180. So theta should be 180 minus alpha, where alpha is the tan inverse of the absolute value of y over x. And this is just an example, right? The takeaway is that it's the same as what we've done before. Oops. And the, the big thing to remember is that the alpha is this tan inverse of the absolute value of b over a. But we got to make sure we're in the correct quadrant. You know what I mean, guys? Just like we'd had to before. So just to remind you guys, um, you're always going to be adding or subtracting from the piece of the horizontal axis of the x-axis that makes up your angle alpha. And if the first or the last axis you crossed was vertical, it's a subtraction problem. If the last axis you crossed was a horizontal, it's an addition problem. So for example, you know, if you're down here, this would be 180 plus alpha. Since the last axis you cross is horizontal. That all rings some bells. Isn't it nice when it's like the same process that we've already done? It's not something new. This will become a regular pattern throughout second semester. It's like we introduce a new, like a new framework, and it turns out that the new framework is the same as the old framework. It's just kind of like a little bit of name adjustment or something, but it's still kind of the same process, which is really cool. Okay, um, and then let's talk about going from um, magnitude and direction to component form. So let's say we have some vector v. And let's say that it's magnitude. I'm just going to write as magnitude v. And its direction, I'm just going to call theta. So to take that magnitude and direction and put it into component form, we're going to do the magnitude times cosine theta for the first component, and then the magnitude times sine theta for the second component. That should look familiar. Right, didn't we do that? Basically that exact formula in first semester when dealing with those vector story problems. We did. Uh, just as a heads up, sometimes this process of going from magnitude and direction to component form is called resolving a vector. So if we might say resolve the vector to component form, and that's really what we mean. Direction, D-I-R.
So let's just do a couple of numeric examples here. We've talked about going back and forth between these different forms. Um, so let's just run through a couple of uh, quickies. Sound good to you guys? God bless you. You're welcome. So let's say we're asked to convert the vector x, y, where x is the point uh, 3, negative 2, and y is the point 5, 1 to component form. So to do that, we're going to do that head minus tail rule that we had discussed previously. Uh, but which one of X and Y is the head and which one is the tail? Uh, yeah, so the our notation here is going to tell us since the arrow part is over the Y, I know that's the head. And since the tail part is over the X, I know that's the tail. Everybody can see that in the little notation on our vector notation there. We cool? So head minus tail, head minus tail. And we're done zoes. Okay, let's say we want to now find the magnitude and direction of the vector u in component form. So the magnitude is just a, or the square root of a squared plus b squared. So that's the square root of 29. If you wanted, you could make that a decimal. It depends on the context of the problem, what they're asking for here. I've given you no indication of rounding or any context of why that you would want to make that a decimal, so I'm just going to leave it as the reduced radical there. And then to get the direction, I would need to draw a picture. So negative 2, 5 is over here. So there's my alpha and 180. So here we're going to say theta is, cos or is equal to 180 minus the tangent inverse of the absolute value of y over x. And I got to, you know, I can't do that one in my head. Now when I uh, type this into my calculator, I'm going to do the absolute value just part in my head and just do tan inverse of 5 over 2 instead of doing all that extra typing to get rid of a negative sign when I could just do that in my head. So I get 111.8.
feel okay doing that? Do I need to move that up? I saw some some bobbing and weaving going on. All right. Um, one more. Okay, so let's say we want to find the component form for the vector u that has direction 224 degrees and magnitude of 5. Well, this is really easy. Component form, so I'm going to use the wedged bracket. Then we're just going to do the magnitude times the cosine of the direction and then the magnitude times sine of that direction. And when I type that stuff into my calculator, I get about negative 3.60 and negative You guys feel okay about shifting back and forth between these different forms, Julia? Uh, it's equal to five? No problem. Okay. So again, these are relatively easy or relatively familiar tasks that we've been asking you to do so far, just changing between the forms. Um, now the form you'll end up using the most is the component form because vector operations are the simplest in component form and getting things into component form is pretty easy. As we've seen, it's either head minus tail or this magnitude cosine direction, comma magnitude sine direction formulas, which are pretty easy to do. So regardless of what the, or how the vector is given, if I'm doing anything with it, the first step is really just I'm going to put it in component form because as we're about to see when we talk about vector operations, doing vector operations in component form is really pretty straightforward and very intuitive, which is what we're looking for. Uh, but often this turns into a problem of like, okay, convert this to component form, do some operations, then convert it back out of component form into whatever the desired format is. Will often be the, the familiar pattern for a lot of these vector problems. Okay. Next up, we're gonna talk about vector operations. So when we say operations, we're talking about things like adding and subtracting and you know jazz like that. Um, to do that, though, we need to define a very special vector called the zero vector. Now, the letter that we use to describe the zero vector, what letter do you suppose we're going to use? Nope. We use the letter O. Why the letter O? It looks like a zero. Now, keep in mind, I am writing the vector hat on top of that. If you do not write the vector hat on top of that, and you just like write like zero equals something, that's wrong. Have to have the vector hat on top of it to know you're talking about the vector zero and not the number zero. Two very different things. So the zero vector is the component form zero, zero. 
or the vector with magnitude equal to zero and no direction. Note that we're not saying the direction is zero degrees. We literally mean no direction. Now this is odd. It's the only vector that is allowed not to have a direction, but it's necessary to have this little loophole to make the arithmetic work. But that's not uncommon. Remember when we talk about the real numbers, every number has a multiplicative inverse except for zero because one over zero is undefined. So much in the same way we have something with a little bit of a loophole here. Okay. Um, so for vector addition and subtraction, if I have um, two vectors in component form, I'm going to call those two vectors u and v with components u1, u2, and v1, v2. to get the sum of those two vectors, or sometimes we call the sum the resultant. We just add the components. The first components add together and the second components add together, exactly like you'd hope it would work, right? Very intuitive, very natural. Now, Geometrically, what are we really doing here? So let's say that this is U, and let's say that, say, this one is V. When we talk about U plus V, what we're describing is here's my U, and then I'm thinking of like another xy axis and then I'm drawing my V and then this now is my U plus V. So when we draw this picture, notice the important part here is that these vectors u and v are drawn head to tail. That's what addition is going to look like geometrically if I'm adding two vectors together, I'm placing them head to tail geometrically. Now, is, is, uh, is vector addition commutative? Does it matter if I do u plus v or v plus u? Look at the way we've defined vector addition and look at the pictures we've drawn. Should it matter? No. So if I had, obviously, like, if u and v, or u1, v1, and u2, v2 are real numbers, it doesn't matter the order that I add those things, right? Everybody agree with that? 
if I draw the picture, if I drew V first and then drew U, still end up at the same spot, right? I'm still drawing the same U plus V. Everybody agree with that? The picture is different, but the U plus V part is in the exact same location. You guys buy that? So vector addition, commutative. Any order, doesn't matter. U plus V, V plus U, doesn't matter. Cool? Okay. Um, so multiplication, we don't really have a vector multiplication. Um, what we have is this new thing called scalar multiplication. So we don't have a way to define like vector times vector, but we do have a, what we're going to define as vector times real number. So for a real number, k, and a vector u, u I just said, If I do k times u, I'm just going to multiply that real number to both components of my vector. That's it. Again, notice here I'm being very careful with my notation. Notice the k has no hat on it. Because the k has no hat, I can tell right away that the k is a real number and not a vector quantity. Since the u does have a hat, I can tell the u is a vector quantity. So I can tell that this dot here is talking about scalar multiplication and not like vector times vector or real number times real number or something else, right? So again, the notation here is important that we're able to tell that that dot here is scalar multiplication and not multiplication or something. Everybody cool? Again, very easy to do though, right? From an arithmetic standpoint, very, very straightforward. Very, very easy. Um, let's just take a little exam trip to example land. So let's say we have two vectors, u and v. So u is negative 2, 4, and v is 7, 3. Yes, and he's sure. While you're gone, you could leave your jacket in your locker. Cool, thanks, dude. Okay, um, so we have three examples here. In the first example, u plus 2v. What operation should I do first? Yeah, multiplication, why? Same order of operations as we'd expect from the real numbers, right? We do multiplication before addition. Yup. So we get 1210. Everybody coolio on that? I didn't show all the work in there, but it's just like adding things together and multiplying by things by two. I didn't feel like I needed to do that. We're cool with the, what I showed though. I did the multiplication first and then I did the addition after that. I didn't write down like the intermediates, but like, come on guys, we don't need to do that, do we? Nah. Okay. Uh, for B, 
nothing much to it. Everybody happy there? Okay. And then my last one, again, multiplication first. And then the addition second. Oh, this is probably worth mentioning. What does scalar multiplication look like geometrically? So let's just say this one. So if this is V here, this would be 4V. Yeah, just scaling it up. We're just stacking four Vs on top of each other, right? Everybody cool with that? I guess I could. I didn't mention that. I thought it was kind of obvious, but then I was like, oh, I didn't mention that. I should probably say something about it. Okay. Um, so another special vector. So one of our special vectors was the zero vector, right? Another special vector is called the unit vector. Uh oh, hey, come back. Thank you. So we say that a vector u is a unit vector if and only if its magnitude is 1. Um, so are unit vectors unique? Nope. How many unit vectors do you think we have? Infinitely many. A lot more than a couple. Whoa, Mr. Cool, I can get out of town. Like, I can see one zero and I can see zero one, but what are the rest of them? Well, remember the unit circle? The point cosine theta comma sine theta represents any point on the unit circle, correct? What's the radius of any point, or the radius on the unit circle is always one, so the length from the origin to that point on the unit circle always has length one. So any point on that unit circle is a unit, represents a unit vector, right? If I write it in component form, rather than as a point, if I choose to write it as a component form vector. Is that cool? So these unit vectors are important because they're basically just a direction vector, right? Is they can, I can write any vector as a unit vector times some scalar. Does that make sense? How would I do that?
right? So if we say, here's our vector v, and I want a unit vector in the same direction as v, So what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate the magnitude of V and multiply it by V. So why are you taking the magnitude? Right, so if I multiply so if I want then the magnitude of u, that would be like this, right? Okay. And I can pull out that scalar because that's all that 1 over the magnitude of v is, is a scalar. And the magnitude of V is just the magnitude of V. So that's one. So it's a unit vector, right? Okay. Yeah. And since all we're doing is scalar multiplying V, does U have the same direction as V? Uh, Absolutely has to, right? Remember the picture we drew before? If all I'm doing is scalar multiplication to the vector, is that direction the vector going to change? Unless you're multiplying by zero, nope. In, case you, in the case you multiply by zero, then you get a zero vector that has no direction. But So that's our formula here. So let's do a quick numeric example. Yeah? So let's say we have the vector 5, 6, and we want to find a unit vector oops, in the same direction as that vector v. Well, I'm going to start by calculating the magnitude of v. Uh, 36 plus 25 is 61. So I'm going to just do 1 over the square root of 61 times the vector 5, 6. That gives me 5 over the square root of 61, comma 6 over the square root of 61. And then I'm just going to rationalize those denominators. And if you really wanted to, we could check to make sure that that is actually a unit vector by calculating its magnitude using the magnitude formula. I promise you it is. But let's just check it real quick. So remember the magnitude is a, the square root of a squared plus b squared. Oops. Hey, come out. Am 
and we get one. Everybody cool? Okay. All right. So at this point, we can um, define two special unit vectors in particular. Preposition keeps on going and going and going. Uh, we call these guys the standard unit vectors. And maybe we should specify that this is in two dimensions. So we denote those as the vectors i and j, where i is the vector 1, 0, and j is the vector 0, 1. I guess that, there, that looks a little bit more i-ish. A little bit, a little, a little too much tail on that i there, maybe for some of your likings. Um, so why do we care about these two special unit vectors? Um, because they're going to allow us to decompose any vector into uh, the sum or difference of these standard unit vectors. So let's say that we have the vector um, CD. Well, I can think about that as the vector C0 plus the vector 0D. Everybody cool with that? And I could think about C0 as the scalar C times the vector 1, 0, and 0D as the scalar D times the vector 0, 1. So there's the uh, super obvious decomposition. So I just have the first component times the vector i and the second component times the vector j, because really the vector i is 1, 0, so it's only representing the first component. The vector j is 0, 1, it only represents the second component. And that's that. Mr. Cool, it's so easy. Just a lot of notation thrown at me, because now I have another form that I can represent a vector in. Yep, that is true. The nice part though about the standard or these uh lin or this is called the linear combination form, by the way. You should probably say that. Um, is that vector addition is really easy. You know, a lot of the vector operations are still quite easy. Okay. Um, new operation. So, so far we've talked about addition and subtraction and scalar multiplication, right? This new operation is called the dot product. So if we have the vector u and the vector v, if we talk about u dot v, what we get is u1 oops, times v1 plus u2 times v2. Notice something unusual here. The dot product of two vectors gives me what kind of quantity? Uh, 
That's just the real number, right? Component times component plus component times component. Not a vector, just a real number. So uh, we have some properties for dot products. You're going to prove these properties in your homework. So we have a commutative property that says u dot v is equal to v dot u. We have a multiplicative property so the zero vector times u is equal to zero. Again, notice the notation there. Uh, we have the distributive property. So here that we have u dot v plus w is equal to u dot v plus u dot w and the order in which we do this um, doesn't matter right if I did v dot w dot u I'm sorry v plus w dot u we're still going to get the same thing here. Because the commutative property, right? V dot U and U dot V are the same things. We have the scalar associative property. And this says KU dot V is equal to the same thing as U dot KV, which is also the same thing as K times U dot V. The distributive property? Yeah. They're all dot. There's no minuses anywhere, anywhere here. Is that better? I dotted them up a little bit for you. Sure. And then the last one is called the magnitude property. And it says that u dot u is equal to the magnitude of u squared. So we're not going to prove these here right now because they actually are homework as part of the homework set to do these proofs. None of them are terribly difficult. Probably the trickiest one is the magnitude one, but it ain't even really that bad.
So let's do a couple of numeric examples here. So we just have a couple vectors, two of them are just defined as components, and the third in that linear combination form. Um, the f so if I have u dot v, that's just going to be the product of the first components plus the product of the second components. So I get negative 17. Now, if I did w dot v, I would probably want to just turn w into component form from linear combination form. So that's just 8, 4. You can just do it on site. The i's are the first component, the j's are the second component, done. So that's 8 times negative 1, oops, plus 4 times, um, what is it, 5. Negative 8 plus 20 equals 12. What if we do this one? U minus W dot 2V. Well, if it's me, um, I would probably prefer to do the, um, sub well, the subtraction we definitely have to do first. So U minus W, 8 minus 4 is, or 8 minus 2 is negative 6. And then 4 minus... I'm sorry, negative 3 minus 4 is negative 7. And then I'm going to do the scalar multiplication here first. Really, you could do the dot product first and then the scalar multiplication, but like, I don't know why you'd want to do it that way, but you could. And then I'm just going to do my dots. Let's see here. Okay. So far, so good. Again, easy calculation to do, right? The dot product's an easy calculation. It's just one of these things like you got to be careful with the notation, keeping track of what's a vector and what's not a vector, and like, am I doing these in the right order? And, you know, but the actual operations themselves are not tricky. There's nothing complicated about what's going on. You just have to make sure you're getting used to the notation and paying attention a little bit. Um, one more big idea left in this section, and that's the angle between two vectors. So let's say this is V and this is U. 
we're talking about this guy as our angle theta. Everybody cool with what we mean by that? Notice that this is written tail to tail. If we're talking about, if you wrote them head to tail, that's something different. That's not the angle between two vectors. So our formula here is cosine theta equals u dot v divided by the magnitude of u times the magnitude of v. Or if you want the theta already isolated, you know, you're doing the cosine inverse. What's important to kind of keep in mind since we're using cosine inverse here? If you remember that the range for cosine inverse is from 0 to 180. So cosine inverse is always going to find you the smaller of the two angles between the two vectors. It would never tell you this one. Right? So it gets a little bit sneaky if you had something like this, where now the theta you're finding is here. It's always going to be the smaller angle between the two vectors. Just kind of keep that in mind if you're drawing a picture and trying to sense out and be like, that, that's 146 degrees. Like the thing I've drawn is bigger than 180. Like what's going on? It's like you're just looking at the wrong side of the, the angle. Does that make sense? Again, not, not usually impacted in you actually doing the calculation, but if you're drawing a picture and trying to verify, like, is this answer even reasonable what I'm doing, it's easy to kind of overlook that idea if it's not, if we don't mention it. Um, in the interest of time, we're going to skip the proof and go straight to an example. You guys have been super sports here for me today, though. So if, let's say I want the angle between vectors u and vector v. There's three things that I need. I need u dot v. I need the magnitude of u and the magnitude of v. Forty nine plus thirty six is eighty five, and four plus four is eight. So I just plug into my formula then. Um, notice I didn't bother to rationalize any denominators or to reduce the radicals or any of those things because I'm just going to take the cosine inverse of whatever that is. So like me doing any extra simplification is just me wasting my time. You know what I mean, guys? So I'm just going to let the calculator handle that. And again, I'm going to use the fraction command on my calculator. So they don't have to worry about so much about like a million and a half parentheses or anything going on here. So I get 85.6 degrees. So that's pretty easy. Um, one last piece, 
This is a rather important definition. We say that the vectors u and v are orthogonal if and only if their dot product is equal to zero. By orthogonal, we mean that they're really is the fancy way of saying perpendicular. They intersect at a right angle. So let's say we have oops, these two vectors, um, negative 5, 8, and then 16, 20. And we want to show that these two vectors are orthogonal. That product comes out to be zero. That'll do it. If I want to show that they're orthogonal, that's all I need to do. So the part for you guys is what can we get through? You do up through 40 there. But that's going to go into next week's problem set, not this week's. Sound good to you guys?